right, we are live. Good evening, everyone, to a wonderful Journal Club, September 2022 for Vestibular First. We are very excited to welcome two really brilliant clinicians, uh, Dr. Dan Gold and Dr. Kristen Steer. I know I was going to mess it up. Steer Nurson. Uh, she can correct me. <laughs> um, Dr. Gold, I'm going to let you go first and introduce yourself further, okay? Sure. No, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, my name is Dan Gold. I'm a Johns Hopkins. I'm a neurologist, a uh, neuro-ophthalmologist. I didn't do a vestibular or neurotology fellowship. There wasn't really one for me to do geographically. Um, I am the fellowship director of our ocular motor and vestibular fellowship for neurologists now, which I think is the only active fellowship program for neurologists in the country currently. I think we have the only two fellows. Uh, but I did do uh, some informal vestibular training with Dr. David Z here at Johns Hopkins. And uh, my practice is really kind of when the worlds of neuroophthalmology and neurotology collide, it's just uh, it's a ton of ton of nystagmus and uh, it's a lot of dizziness and it's it's a lot of fun. So um, we'll get to know each other much better over the course of the next hour. But happy to be here. Awesome. And I'm Kristen Steenerson. I'm a Plano neurotologist, so neurology trained and. I did get to do a fellowship with Terry Fife at Barrow Neurological Institute, uh, Institute following um, residency at Mayo. I'm currently at Stanford, and um, I'm so happy to be here and hope that I can contribute. Wonderful. Well, we are really lucky to have you. You're both authors on the paper we're going to discuss tonight. And that paper is titled Non-Vestibular Dizziness. And of course, we want to acknowledge there are several other authors on this paper who all contributed uh, in very important ways. But I have learned that it is pretty difficult to have many, many people on a journal club at once. So uh, we're lucky to have a couple of uh, really excellent representatives from this group. So thanks to the rest for your contributions as well. All right, so we're going to dig into this article right away because there is a ton to cover <laughs> under causes of dizziness that are not related to the vestibular system in this paper. So we'll try to maximize our time here. So first, I always like to show this slide. This is a way for us just to kind of get on the same page as a group because we have such a diverse group of uh, folks who like to attend this journal club. So if we're going to talk about what's non-vestibular dizziness, we'll just briefly touch on what is the vestibular system first. This is our inner ear balance system. You'll see it pictured in kind of that blue uh, apparatus, I think I have heard it termed, and kind of near that uh, ear of the patient's, I guess I would call that their right ear, um, and the brain. So this connection between the vestibular system and the brain is key, um, and anywhere along uh, the pathways there or that apparatus, there could be problems that can create dizziness. However, uh, that leads us to non-vestibular dizziness. So overall, dizziness is pretty common. Uh, it's estimated 5% of all primary care visits are with a, a kind of a primary complaint of dizziness, and approximately 35% of Americans report a lifetime prevalence of dizziness. So, you know, this is a big <laughs> deal, uh, a big symptom, but of course it, it's underneath what I consider to be a wide umbrella of potential kind of contributors to that feeling of dizziness. So I wanted to point out, but we'll not go into detail on this um, graphic here on the right of this slide. It's a beautiful graphic. I think it's helpful for folks who are just getting familiar with some of the problems that can happen within the vestibular system. And so I'll let you look at that at your leisure, uh, or you can look up the article there. You can see it's in the British Medical Journal. So uh, broadly speaking, the differential diagnosis for dizziness be broken down into two categories, vestibular, which could be the central or the brain, or peripheral, which would be our inner ear, uh, or non-vestibular sources of dizziness. And this graphic I also really like. Um, it's colorful. I always consider that a plus. And on top of that, we have, you know, come the most common causes of dizziness. So we see our old friend that we've talked about at other journal clubs, BPPV, e, BPPV is on there. Uh, so those little kind of oh, tiny stones that go to place in our inner ear. 
uh, ranging through different issues with the brain and other problems with the inner ear that can occur. And then of course, these other causes of dizziness. So, um, you know, this article I know um, covers uh, visual disturbances, autonomic issues. We're gonna dig into some of that now. So my first uh, kind of subtopic in this article that we come upon is superior oblique myokymia. So this is an area that I believe Dr. Gold has some experience in. So I'm gonna let him kind of in his own words explain what is this condition. Sure, and uh, let me just preface, uh, I guess, everything by saying that that these these patients are tough, right? And there are uh, quite a few patients who, after the meeting, I, I still am not sure what's going on, whether it's vestibular or non-vestibular. I guess I would say, in general, if somebody has dizziness, it's probably vestibular if they experience associated nausea and head motion intolerance, and there's some sense of, of motion, whether it's internal or external. There's some imbalance associated with that, with that symptom. Um, but it's really hard, especially in the emergency department when the stakes are, are potentially very high. There are a lot of patients who come in and they just have continuous dizziness and they have no ocular motor findings at all, no abnormalities, no spontaneous nystagmus. And so you really have to rely heavily on the history in some of these patients um, and, and all of these patients. I saw a patient on, what is today? Yesterday, I guess. Today's Tuesday? Yes, yesterday. That's how you know you're in the healthcare and, uh, profession. It right, all blurs together. <laughs> right. And, and a couple of months ago, she had an episode of, of world spinning, nausea, vomiting that sounded very vestibular, lasting for a couple of hours. And I was very concerned about TIAs in her case. And she's older and has vascular risk factors. But she actually presented because of these newer 10 second long episodes of just the sort of vague dizziness without any of those other features. So could this be vestibular paroxysmia in the absence of any ear symptoms? Maybe, but you have to think about the heart. You have to think about those other potentially dangerous causes. Could this be cardiac? So um, I just want to preface everything by saying that even for us, it's, it's sometimes really hard. And it, it always sort of takes the, the, the team approach and um, taking that history the first time and then retaking it the second time if you just don't know. And sometimes there, there are additional clues or something that the patient remembered. Um, I also always have patients if they can take a video of their eyes during an attack. And sometimes, you know, it doesn't sound particularly vestibular, but they send me a video and mm -hmm. they clearly have spontaneous nystagmus. And so that is almost certainly a vestibular problem. So just want to put that out there that these patients all... Dizzy patients are not, not easy. Um, so superior oblique myokymia, I, I kind of, uh, uh, my fellow from last year, Dr. Owen Murphy and I kind of picked three visual disorders that we thought were kind of of interest that, that were worth a mention that perhaps some people weren't too familiar with. One of them was superior oblique myokymia. And um, this is a condition, I guess I would say more generally, any sort of ocular oscillation um, or intrusion or nystagmus can cause oscillopsia, the, the illusion of uh, that a stationary object is in motion. And usually that's pretty easy, right? The vision's bouncing, it's independent of head movement, so you're thinking more of a, an eye movement problem like nystagmus rather than a, a head-dependent head oscillopsia where you think about a bilateral vestibular loss. But some patients, really, it's, it's, it's very challenging to know what their dizziness means to them. Is their dizziness actually oscillopsia? If they have nystagmus and they're not complaining of a, a clear oscillopsia, a vision bouncing, jumping, um, but when they close their eyes, the dizziness goes away, then that should make you think about some eye movement problem, some visual problem like superior oblique myokymia, um, like some whatever nystagmus you see, for instance. Um, if they have vestibular dizziness rather than sort of a visual dizziness, then if they close their eyes, it shouldn't really matter. They should, that imbalance, those, those sensations should typically persist regardless of eyes open or eyes closed. 
So superior oblique myokymia, um, this is the superior oblique muscle. Its primary action is in cycloduction. And I'm not sure where my hand is here. <laughs> I don't know what they can see. I'm seeing two, two of me on my screen. Um, <laughs> But the primary action is in cycloduction. So my right eye, uh, there's right left confusion. I'm going to stop using right and left. <laughs> so it's in cycloduction. Uh, the secondary action is depression. So if there is an irritable superior oblique muscle, oftentimes we think um, it's related to some neurovascular compression of the fourth nerve, which innervates the superior oblique muscle. That nerve can sort of go into a spasm, can contract when it shouldn't contract. And if it contracts when it shouldn't contract, then it's gonna do what it likes to do. And it's going to in cycloduct as well as depress. So those patients may simply experience oscillopsia from that in cycloduction, or they may experience um, an in cyclo, a, a, an oscillopsia that is monocular just in the affected eye. So ask them, what happens if they cover the right eye? What happens if they cover the left eye? But because the secondary action is depression, those patients can also experience simultaneous vertical diplopia as well. So it's something to be aware of. Um, sometimes it's very obvious, and I'm happy to show an example of, of what that is. But if somebody has monocular oscillopsia, um, especially if there's also diplopia, always think about the possibility of superior oblique myokymia. Here. Nice. I'm going to go so ahead. So those, and... those are the keys. Perfect. Let's go ahead and go to that share so that you can uh, yep. show that video for us. All right. Here is one that I just took last week. Oops, I'm just sharing. Let me just share my screen. Sure, no problem. I think I accidentally closed it. Sorry. No worries. Once. Take your time. You're good. You're good. You're good. Got it. All right. And so this is through the slit lamp, which gives you some magnification. And can you see that little bit of torsion? Mm -hmm. Everything's easier in slow motion. Can you see <laughs> if you just pick a little landmark on the iris there? Are you able to appreciate that? I don't know how well you're seeing this yeah, or how clearly good. you're seeing it. Yep, little... So sometimes it's it's very obvious. Sometimes it's it's more subtle. Um, I can show one quick example of somebody uh, labeled really prominent. And while you're and so, go ahead. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So pick your favorite conjunctival blood vessel. <laughs> And it's just going and going and going. This is uh, a superior oblique myokymia that you could kind of see from across the room. And do you see that? Just pick, keep looking at one blood vessel. So it's not nice stagmus, even though there is a slow and a fast phase, but here the fast phase is irritation. It's contraction of the superior oblique and the slow phase is just a relaxation back to primary. Right. So um, be aware of this problem. Uh, this is commonly underdiagnosed, nobody has any has ever heard of it, nobody thinks about it, it is treatable, there are medications and, and patients walk around for oftentimes years. Right, now I, so. I noticed that in the article and um, it's interesting, you're talking about kind of these, the ability of a patient to describe their symptoms and what that means and I think what we're coming to is, you know, this is why the physical exam and, you know, when needed different tests are so important because you know, if you were to try to offer a diagnosis based on the patient saying, you know, things look wiggly or something, that's really like kind of difficult to pin down, you know, what that feels like. And I've certainly had patients who, you know, their eyes are dancing you know, with clear BBBV type nystagmus and they'll say, I feel a little weird. 
they deny spinning. They deny, you know what I'm saying? Like, no, I'm not dizzy. No, I just feel a little weird. Like that's their perception. And I think, you know, it parallels pain in that way that people can, you know, have a lot of different experiences and then describe it very differently. You know, even if they had the same injury, let's say with somebody in the room next door in the ER and they could, you know, say, oh, no, it's burning. Oh, no, it's just a little too, you know, like it's just amazing how the, you know, the brain and, and how that all kind of comes into play with how we experience things. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate that having the videos to really help us see uh, what that would look like and how that does look different than what I would call a, a vestibular type nystagmus um, based on my right. experience. So very good. Um, this is a good time to plug your video library, which is fantastic. <laughs> so I have a link at the end of the slides here, but um, University of Utah, uh, Dr. Gold has a very excellent eye video library jam packed with both the rare and the more common of <laughs> different types of eye movements. So check that out if you're into watching eyes. Um, so I think you highlighted some of these things, Dr. Gold, just kind of um, the, the, what happens when we close an eye uh, or kind of cover that affected eye and how you might be able to view this better. Um, you were showing with the slit lamp technique, not everybody has access to that, um, but something that's maybe a little bit more commonly available would be infrared video goggles or some way to kind of uh, view the eye um, through video oculography. So um, just kind of different ways to try to see those more the kind of subtle, small eye movements that might be hard to kind of catch if, if they're, you know, more uh, less dramatic than that second video you had, we'll say. Right. I would just say for any torsional movements as well, um, the Frenzel goggles work really well. You're able to really see the, the conjunctival blood vessels and kind of follow it. As opposed to infrared goggles, it's actually a lot harder. God, good point. Good point. Yep. So a lot of different options out there, depending on what we're looking for. Um, I don't know uh, if you agree with this. It's a, a statistic I found when I was kind of looking up a little bit more about this condition. It's relatively rare. Would you say that that is your experience? I know you kind of have a different experience uh, by your referrals, but. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's rare. Yes. Um, it, those patients, I kind of flock to my clinic, I guess. Uh, it's it's a quite a referral bias, but it's it's pretty, pretty rare. But these patients, like I said, are undiagnosed for very long periods of time. So. Uh, if you if you were able to recognize it, a neuroophthalmologist will recognize it, but um, very few other people will. Got it. Very very good point. Except for for Dr. Steenerson, she she'd recognize it. <laughs> of course, of course. Of course. All right. Great. Um, yep. So you mentioned some different treatment options, and uh, you know that that can provide some relief for these patients. So excellent work. All right. We're going to move on to favorite topic of mine, visual vertigo. Um, so uh, these patients have dizziness triggered by visual motion or complex visual environments. Uh, so they'll complain about, you know, like when a train goes past me quickly or I'm in the grocery aisle and there's a lot of different stuff on the uh, shelves. Um, you know, I cannot go to an IMAX video. Are you kidding? That would, you know, <laughs> completely put me over the edge. These are the kind of things they might report. Um, and it is true that in the literature they have found that people with visual vertigo often have a, some sort of preceding vestibular issue or injury um, that kind of seems to sometimes contribute to the development of this uh, sensitivity to visual motion or a visual environment. Um, so one thing that you point out in your article together is that treating that underlying symptoms or the underlying conditions such as vestibular migraine um, could help actually reduce these symptoms in and of itself and also to attend to anxiety and depression because although not everyone with visual vertigo has that, um, it can be comorbid and should not go ignored. Um, so this is where anyone with visual vertigo doesn't probably want to look at my slide. Um, <laughs> so uh, the brain is relying too much on information from the visual system. This is what they call visual dependency. Um, so you hear different terms kind of being thrown around here, but essentially the way I describe it to patients sometimes is that the brain is kind of just decided not to trust the information from the vestibular system um, due to some vestibular issue. 
And that can be one reason why the brain kind of says, okay, fine, whatever you say, vision, you know, whatever's going on, I'll just, you know, you'll be the lead. Um, and so this is kind of a reweighting of the importance of information. And so then when a patient gets exposed to a lot of visual information, essentially they can kind of get overwhelmed. Um, and so it can be different kind of issues for different folks. Some people hate stripes, some people hate moving waves. I have heard blinking Christmas lights, you name it. <laughs> um, so, you know, something that bothers one person may not bother another person, but this is the general pattern we see. So um, perhaps, uh, I don't know if either of you are familiar with some of these imaging studies. So feel free to jump in if you want to speak to them. I see a head nodding. Dr. Stevenson, are you familiar with some of the, the research that they've done with this? Oh, yeah. So looking at functional MRIs, there have been some trends towards changes in the cortical networks that are activated when presented with these certain environmental situations that may show that there are differences in brains that are trending towards visual vertigo symptoms compared to those brains that don't experience those symptoms. Right. Right. So, you know, this is where the patient says, oh, can you do a regular MRI and tell me what's wrong or why I have this? And, you know, the answer is firmly no. But this is a way to me to be able to say, look, this is a real thing. This is not something you're imagining. Um, your brain is processing information somewhat differently. And so we need to kind of help. Um, hopefully the goal of at least physical therapy with this vestibular rehab is to decrease some sensitivity to visual information, to reweight the system a bit back towards, you know, trusting other sensory information like body, body information, proprioceptive information, um, and, and upticking the vestibular system's abilities as much as possible, depending on the circumstances, what their kind of underlying conditions might be. So, all right. In this article, uh, Dr. Gold, I believe you probably put a plug in, <laughs> an ophthalmology assessment could be useful to rule out an ocular disorder. Whoa, can, I, can you kind of speak to that a little more for us? Yeah, I mean, as I said, there, there's so much overlap potentially between the visual and the vestibular systems, and, and they're so intertwined. So it's just, it's a good idea to make sure that you're not missing something ophthalmic that could be potentially treatable, or is there uh, more photophobia than mm. sort of visual vertigo? And could that be due to dry eye or some ocular condition, for instance? So uh, if it's pure visual vertigo, then that's unlikely to have anything to do with sort of the visual system primarily um, and and much more likely to, to have been sort of a consequence of some vestibular injury or anything that affects balance or causes dizziness and leads somebody to be more dependent on visual inputs. So that that's why I would just uh, recommend that at least they have kind of a screening eye exam and and I'll, again, always thinking about those things that are potentially treatable. Absolutely. And I think this is a good opportunity for you to go ahead and explain to uh, everybody the differences between an optometrist and an ophthalmologist, because I'll have patients say, oh, I just went to the eye doctor. <laughs> and I'll say, did they say A or B and work on your glasses? Oh, yes. <laughs> and I'm not saying that optometrists are not vitally important to eye health and eye care. Um, but perhaps you can speak to why you might still, as a physical therapist or some other clinician, um, you know, want to kind of think about when would be right to refer a patient to ophthalmology. Right. So it really depends on kind of where you are and, and kind of who's around. Um, I mean, there are many optometrists who deal with a lot of pathology and are very, very good with, with that pathology. There are a lot of optometrists who just prescribe glasses. Uh, not, I shouldn't say just prescribe glasses. They prescribe glasses. They do a really good job. And if they see something abnormal, they, they might refer to ophthalmology. And there's nothing wrong with that. So it kind of depends where they are. If their role is, is uh, refracting and checking for glasses and dealing with some mild dry eye and things like that, then in that situation, um, it, it might be a good idea to have that patient be seen by an ophthalmologist in addition to that optometrist. Uh, so it, it, it really depends. Awesome. Depends on their comfort level, where you are in the country, many other factors. Absolutely. And internationally, I'm sure it's its own 
situation in every country. So it's just, yeah, see what, what your resources are, I think is a good way to put that. I like that. All right. Um, so just from a physical therapy perspective, to let the clinicians know that there are some different tools out there, one of which is the Visual Vertigo Analog Scale. It's a nice tool. Um, has more questions than what you see here, but it kind of pulls out the idea of, you know, if you're seeing a tendency for people to mark high towards a 10 on dizziness uh, for, you know, things that are kind of more this visual type stim, um, not only is that helpful to kind of say, okay, this looks like this could be a piece of the puzzle for this patient, but also um, some people do use it as a way to hopefully mark improvement uh, as you're kind of working through vestibular rehab, for example. And uh, it's a nice way to differentiate. So if people are kind of experiencing more panic attacks or, you know, anxiety, maybe they feel that way in a supermarket. So you can't totally say, okay, it's visual vertigo. But um, again, if you're seeing, oh, well, I don't care about traffic. I don't care about riding in a car. Okay, like, you know, it's kind of leading you down a path. So you're trying to get a sense of patterns, uh, which I think is most of diagnosis uh, for a lot of us is kind of, you know, okay, what's kind of fitting this pattern? Um, of kind of visual stimulation being the key here. Um, and so for treatment, uh, physical therapy, to me, it's just like start light and build up. Um, and I think that you have both probably had patients that maybe didn't have that experience and you know, it was not a positive experience. So we wanna make sure that uh, anyone who's applying vestibular rehab takes this approach. Um, so I always start the patient, for example, they're looking at um, a pattern checkerboard. They're like, oh, yeah, that makes me a little bit dizzy. Okay, great. But they're like, whoa, don't even make me look at that. Do not start at the checkerboard, please. <laughs> so you got to kind of start with something that's mildly challenging um, and then give them activity to do with it, whether it's um, looking at one letter and then looking at another letter that's kind of post-it noted on there. There's tons of strategies. This is not a vestibular rehab lecture, but <laughs> suffice to say, um, you know, you do want to be gentle. And then cueing is key. So if you just say to the patient, okay, just look at the waves until you can't look at them anymore, that's not really, to me, a good approach <laughs> to vestibular rehab for someone with visual sensitivity. Um, I give them, again, usually a target, like you're seeing here, a post-it note with a check as an example. And I tell them, okay, I want you to try to ignore the, all the stuff on the grocery shelves, just look at that. Or you know, maybe they're gonna move their head with it. Again, it's really specific to the person and what level of stimulation they can tolerate. I might start with 10 seconds. <laughs> you know, you start real light and if they did well with that and see how they respond over the next day, like over the next few days, don't just like say, say, oh, you did well, let's go ahead and do 30 seconds. Like you don't know if they're gonna have kind of after effects later, especially like vestibular migraine, for example, um, can kind of have a delayed response in my experience to STEM. Uh, so, you know, just kind of uh, thinking about how we treat um, and teaching the patient to again, reweight Feel where your body is. Feel that your shoulders are over your hips. You know, people talk call this grounding. I don't care what term you want to use, <laughs> but the point is you're kind of trying to reweight the sensory system. All right, we're ready to switch gears, step away from visual vertigo, and go into MLF syndrome. And I'm going to hand this back to Dr. Gold. Yeah, again, as a neuro, neuro ophthalmologist, I, I love the, the medial longitudinal fasciculus. It is, uh, it's the 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 fascicle the sort of the nerves that connects uh the lateral rectus uh sorry the six nucleus to the opposite medial rectus and it's its job is to make sure that when you're looking to the right both eyes move to the right and when you're moving your eyes to the left both eyes move to the left together conjugately that's its its kind of main um main responsibility but let me just share my screen here i just wanted to just quickly point out two other things that that it does can you see my screen here yes okay so number one it's going to carry those interneurons that are going to connect uh the lateral i'm sorry the six nucleus to the contralateral medial rectus subnucleus so that the eyes move together so if you have a disconnection, then if, if you ask somebody to look to the left, the left eye will AB duct, but the right eye won't be able to AD duct. So that, again, you can have diplopia in complete isolation from an internuclear ophthalmoplegia, an INO, and that patient's probably not going to make it into your clinic for that reason. But 
patients with uh, with strokes that involve this structure, um, the medial longitudinal fasciculus, or patients with multiple sclerosis, where MLF lesions are very, very common, it's important to know that the MLF carries the vertical semicircular canal pathways. And an MLF lesion is going to, sorry, I'm trying to get rid of this, is going to affect the connections between the vestibular system and the cyclovertical muscles. What do I mean by that? I mean those um, extraocular muscles, the superior rectus, inferior rectus, and the oblique muscles that are not just going to move the eyes up and down, but also cycloduct them. And so this patient has an acute left medial longitudinal fasciculus stroke. And this is what we see on the MRI, this little spot. But this patient has upbeat torsional nystagmus because again, you're disrupting the vertical semicircular canal pathways. And if it happens acutely, that static imbalance is going to create spontaneous nystagmus. And so this might look like maybe posterior canal BPPV if it were triggered, but this is a patient who's upright and this is happening continuously. So again, the MLF carries vertical semicircular canal pathways and an acute imbalance like a stroke, like an MLF or like a, a patient with, with MS who has an acute exacerbation can cause vertical torsional nystagmus. It also carries the, the gravity dependent, the utriculo-ocular motor pathways. And so what is a potential result from a, a damage to these pathways? You can have a skew deviation. You can have a non-paralytic, meaning that ductions are normal, normal, vertical ocular misalignment, meaning that one eye is higher, utricle ocular motor pathway asymmetry, meaning that there's a lesion somewhere along this pathway from the peripheral labyrinth, from the utricle itself, um, through these, these uh, central pathways up to the interstitial nucleus of Cajal. So I just wanted to throw that out there and just uh, make sure that everybody knows that it's, it's not just about the conjugate eye movements for the MLF, but you can also have central vestibular symptoms mm -hmm. um, and signs as a result. Also, if a patient with MS has bilateral MLF lesions, which they commonly do, that can affect bilateral vertical semicircular canal pathways and cause bilateral vestibular loss. So these patients might have a so-called walking or head movement dependent oscillopsia because of VOR loss. So there's a lot going on yeah. in the animal. <laughs> That's an important little area. Let's not mess it up. <laughs> All right. Uh, yep, so you highlighted a lot of the symptoms there in your discussion that we see here on this slide. And again, those video examples are really helpful. Um, and I think uh, the skew deviation is also helpful for folks to again remember. Uh, I think test of skew is something that people sometimes do uh, acutely and uh, in the ER, but perhaps also an outpatient. Not a bad idea just to see what you see, but of course, someone um, with an abnormal alignment, there could be a few different reasons. Uh, is that correct, Dr. Gold? Yeah, lots of different reasons. So if somebody has vertical diplopia, that doesn't mean they have a skew. If they have uh, an abnormal test of skew, which is just an alternate cover test, if it's an abnormal or positive test of skew, that just means that there's some vertical misalignment, right? You uncover an eye and it comes down, or you uncover an eye and it comes up. But that doesn't mean it's a skew. In the setting of the acute vestibular syndrome, when somebody has continuous ongoing symptoms and vertical diplopia, you should consider that to be a skew until proven otherwise. But there are many causes for vertical diplopia and vertical misalignment. Myasthenia gravis, thyroid eye disease, third nerve palsy, congenital strabismus, a million things. So it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that 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 it, it's always a skew and also there's no such thing as a horizontal skew so if you say skew you're implying a vertical misalignment also wanted to put that out there i like it a little pet peeve good um <laughs> so yes and i agree and i think that's you know where i think you know sometimes i'll have students they'll say oh no like misalignment and i'll say well is it known do we know why like if the person's like oh yeah 
I always had a lazy eye or whatever. <laughs> like, you know, if you don't know right. or something's new, um, I think it's a good opportunity to point out the idea of referral and how we might say, oh, I don't know, you know, and who would be the best person to send to? Again, of course, depends on who's available in your area. Could be neurology, could be neuroophthalmology, somewhere in that realm. Am I missing someone else that we should consider, Dr. Gold? Yeah, I mean, I would say, so it's it's hard to know, right? If somebody has acute diplopia and dizziness, uh, that that's certainly neuro-ophthalmology territory. If, you, if the patient sees an ophthalmologist, um, probably they're going to want them to see a, a neuro-ophthalmologist as well. Many, the vast majority of neurologists don't really understand this stuff either. So I wouldn't assume that sending them to a neurologist is going to get them the right diagnosis. Um, I'm a neurologist, so I can say that. Um, <laughs> But it's 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 hard. I just gave a, a, a sixty minutes strabismus and skew talk, and um, it's it's really tough mm -hmm. uh, without the tools of the neuro ophthalmologist. Mm. Um, sometimes to just distinguish a skew from a fourth, but it's it's the history. It's its own separate, very th comprehensive, different kind of exam as well. So I'll leave it at that for now. Fair enough. Fair enough. I think that gives us food for thought. All right. So uh, what we pulled out of the article here, a couple thoughts, dizziness with eye movements, particularly horizontal gaze, uh, could be a hint towards this condition or an issue with this area of the brain. Uh, and then an, that you mentioned that abnormal adducting eye on the same side of the lesion and that you may see nystagmus of the abducting eye. So a lot of different findings here. I hope no one would mistake this for a peripheral vestibular condition. This is definitely something that, you know, we're looking at, okay, there's a lot of stuff going on here. I tell students, if it's just not following rules and it's kind of all over the place, you know, consider central issues because, you know, uh, usually anything goes uh, with central vestibular um, and just uh, kind of stroke and other conditions that kind of really affect multiple uh, areas, right? Uh, treatment wise, uh, what I pulled out of the article here is that there's no specific treatment. So you want to look at root cause and treat root cause if you can, such as MS and uh, medications for that. And some people reporting that when you wear spectacles with thick frames, that can kind of help reduce symptom uh, perception, we'll say. Does that seem accurate, Dr. Gold? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I under underemphasize the the I and O part of this, the intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. I showed the one example where uh, the patient was asked to look to the left and the right eye just didn't move, right? That patient's going to have diplopia. But sometimes it's just a little bit of a lag. It's an adducting lag that you might only see when you test horizontal saccades. And in that case, it might not be diplopia. It might be that that the lag is so subtle that it's just sort of following behind the normal, normally kind of the normal abducting saccade and the patient just experiences a little visual lag or a little bit of kind of a blur when they move their eyes quickly, not their head, but move their eyes. This is another situation where the history is really important. Having the patient recreate the symptoms in the clinic while keeping the head completely still mm -hmm. Right, because it it can be tough to tease out: is this eye movement related or is this head movement related? So isolate one and check each individually, or close the eyes, move the head. Right, if that's visual, then then that that shouldn't uh, recreate or reproduce those symptoms as well. Very good, very good. All right, I'm going to switch gears again. I'm going to go to autonomic dizziness. So. Uh, Covered in this section of the article is orthostatic hypotension, which is a sudden blood drop in blood pressure caused by a change in posture towards upright. Um, many possible causes, dehydration, all the way to other serious things like various neurologic conditions. So um, a different condition that still falls underneath the autonomic nervous system uh, issue umbrella would be POTS or postular, postular, oh my goodness, orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. So this is where um, we have an increase in heart rate. So that's the tachycardic portion um, that increases in standing and then an orthostatic intolerance. So um, 
there's lots of details in this section about kind of numbers that we're looking for, when it should happen, um, and that we're looking, as particularly in POTS, for something that's kind of chronic in nature. This is not like a one-day thing. Um, <laughs> and uh, I wanted to maybe uh, ask Dr. Sternerson to kind of help us, because I know a lot of folks sometimes try to screen one or both of these by having somebody lie down and then sit up and then stand up with certain time frames versus the tilt table test. Can you tell us kind of what's most valuable here when you're concerned about these conditions? Yeah, I think it, it is really challenging because people can have symptomatic days and asymptomatic days. So there is always that challenge of trying to capture them while having symptoms. But just doing a screening orthostatic blood pressure test can be super helpful in these patients. It's not being done routinely in the physician's office. It's not being done routinely definitely by the patient either. Um, so it can be really helpful on the therapy side if someone thinks about this, if it hasn't been done yet. Um, and so the just the um, typical CDC recommendations for orthostatic um, blood pressure testing have the patient lie down for three to five minutes, ideally not talking, resting, trying to get their steady state, and then obtaining their blood pressure and heart rate. And then you actually can just stand them up. And after three to five minutes, also not talking, take another blood pressure measurement and see what the changes in their blood pressure, systolic, diastolic, and heart rate is standing versus the lying flat. You can do a sitting in between to try and get a trend over, but to meet diagnostic criteria, you really just need the standing and hopefully they can stand for at least that three to five minute period. Um, what's challenging is because it's so dynamic, some patients may have a delayed response in their autonomic nervous system. So they may have um, an initial response that's accurate. And so there isn't a great enough change to meet criteria for anything like POTS or orthostatic hypotension or initial orthostatic hypotension. And so what can happen is after 10, 20, 30 minutes, sometimes patients that have been upright for that extended period of time can then have a sudden drop in their systolic blood pressure or their diastolic blood pressure. Um, and so that's something known as delayed orthostatic hypotension. So if you have a normal screening test, but you have a strong suspicion that this person is having this postural dizziness or orthostatic intolerance that has a delayed onset, that's a perfect time to get a, a tilt table test. Um, also, if you have other clues, if you're concerned about a neurodegenerative condition, maybe they have a little bit of a Parkinson's gait or they have a little bit of a flat affect, their face um, isn't very responsive, they have um, a low volume to their voice, there's any type of tremor, there's Parkinson's in the family, or any kind of neurodegenerative condition clues, um, tilt table testing can be really helpful in that context as well. Um, and maybe even the full autonomic battery, because you can get other clues in terms of their full autonomic testing that indicates there is some autonomic disorder overall. Um, or the static hypotension, for someone who's normotensive, doesn't have high blood pressure, you're looking for that 20, um, 20 uh, millimeters mercury drop in systolic or 10 millimeters mercury drop in diastolic, but that's increased to 30 for someone who is hypertensive. So just something to keep in mind. Um, and then for postural tachycardia, there can't, there's technically not supposed to be an orthostatic hypotensive component to it. You really should just have a postural tachycardia. Um, but sometimes patients can have that too, and they might be a little bit hypovolemic, they're dehydrated, and so they can have this um, combination type of presentation. So it doesn't completely rule that out. Um, but yeah, these can be really tricky because they can say identical descriptors to their dizziness um, as someone who has a vestibular disorder, especially with things like 3PD or persistent postural perceptual dizziness where those patients are dizziest when they're standing up, which can sound really similar to someone who has autonomic dysfunction. And we know there is this kind of cyclical nature between those two, that you can have autonomic dysfunction that triggers your 3PD, and then you can have this reactivation of your 3PD because the autonomic nervous system is still having dysfunction re-igniting um, that 3PD responsiveness. Uh, so it can be really heterogeneous, so it's just super helpful to have everyone thinking about this and screen them at least once to make sure we're not missing a hemodynamic component that would be a, a very different treatment um, plan compared to 
just a 3PD or vestibular disorder. Very good point. And anyone who's really lost about 3PD can watch last month's Journal Club, <laughs> which is on 3PD. So we won't go past that there. But that's a really great point. And I think highlights something that we'll see again and again, which is that folks can have multiple contributors to dizziness and to really think carefully about that and not just assume it's one thing. Uh, so treating POTS in particular, uh, just pulled this from a uh, nice research, standingupforpots.org. Um, they're talking about, you know, fluids and sodium, and we're not going to dig into all this, but just to know there is, a, you know, uh, plenty of treatment. This is definitely could be its own journal club as far as POTS. It's a pretty, can be a pretty involved situation depending on the patient. So just know that there are, are some good treatments available. And exercise, says the physical therapist. <laughs> all right. Uh, we're going to go on to cervicogenic dizziness because, you know, we've got time constraints here. Um, this is a nonspecific sensation of altered orientation in space. I fell off, funny. Uh, sometimes they'll describe it as dizziness, uh, but the proposed cause can be an abnormal afferent signal from the neck. I always say the neck doesn't know where it is. That helps the patient understand. <laughs> um, and so that, you know, kind of neck not being sure where it is versus information from the eyes and the vestibular system, if they're not all jiving, um, then the patient might feel kind of off in some way. Um, so usually it's not like a spinning vertigo description in my experience uh, as much as kind of more this off feeling. Um, there's a lot of questions about nystagmus and cervicogenic dizziness. And so I wanted to put that to, well, either whoever wants to jump in, uh, have you seen it? Is it always a certain direction? Uh, do you think it's a major or minor component of this condition? Yeah, I think I'll start by just saying, I think of cervicogenic dizziness as kind of the black box of possibility that there's a lot of people who are dizzy. There's a lot of people who have neck pain. And so sometimes we can um, create a causal relationship there that may or may not be there. And there are a lot of proposed diagnostic criteria, but there hasn't been really a consensus statement on diagnostic criteria for cervicogenic dizziness. So I really rely a ton on the physical therapist to help out um, with their neck assessments, looking at flexibility, looking at um, deep neck um, flexion strength and looking for any other type of postural instability. Um, and then if we have the luxury of infrared goggles with that, then sometimes um, I will uh, potentially hear about nystagmus patterns. I'm not sure about the mechanism related to that. Um, the few times I have seen nystagmus, I'm more worried about uh, posterior circulation um, insufficiency that might be going on as opposed to a direct apparent cause to the nystagmus. Um, but I think there's still a lot of research that's needed there. And I'd be really interested, Dan, in your perspective about nystagmus originating from cervicogenic. Yeah, I agree. I don't I don't know. I don't know that anybody uh, has has any great explanation for for much of this. I think that um, Tim Haynes' website has a lot on cervicogenic dizziness, uh, very thorough. I believe that uh, through the the Barani Society, uh, a consensus statement is forthcoming. Yes, and it works. Got it. It went hopefully in the, I think in this sometime this year, well, I guess we're, we're approaching the end of the year. I'm not sure. I think <laughs> in the next year is what it seemed like from uh, the talk at, at the meeting. So hopefully we'll have more uh, answers and clear answers soon, but I agree. It's, it's tough because as anybody knows who sees these patients with vestibular migraine or triple BD, They've got neck issues. They're not moving their head normally. They're like this. They have this sort of high risk postural state and, uh, and neck pain develops. So is it the chicken or the egg? Uh -huh. I guess a lot of, a lot of times um, I'll just, for myself and for the patient, especially a lot of patients come in, somebody said that there's a cervicogenic component or wondered about the neck. And if you are able to rotate them in the chair with everything together, right? they're not moving the head on the body. They're just moving everything together and they get dizzy. Then that can't be fully explained by cervicogenic dizziness. Um, so I, I will demonstrate that a lot for myself and, and also for the patients. And I also like to think about the trigeminal cervical complex that we see is so heavily, um, so heavily plays a role in vestibular migraine and 
other types of migraine, of course. So I always wonder about that. Is this a manifestation of migraine from mm. a supergenic source that we need to consider as well? Yes. So many good And also, also, I would say I rely very heavily on physical therapists here. <laughs> much, much more of an expert here than I am. So yeah. Agreed. Well, I think this chart was excellent. I think everybody should take a look in the article at it. It really is a nice way to kind of try to think a little more about how we approach differential diagnosis, what we might see in the neck that might lead us down the path of neck being something we should address. And I think that's the way I like to think of it is, you know, um, if I'm working with the neck and we're moving the head, we're also stimulating the vestibular system. It's really hard for treatment to totally separate. Um, but I don't mind as long as they're getting better. <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of my like proof is in the pudding that like we needed to move the neck and whether that's because, you know, they had vestibular issues, but they were kind of guarding at the neck. And so I needed to start there. I'm okay with that. And I think that could be true of multiple, you know, kind of coexisting issues, whether it's migraine, concussion, um, you know, a peripheral vestibular situation that the patient is kind of not really adapting because they're not really moving their head or whatever. So, um, you can see it all or a mix, um, <laughs> again, layers to the onion to me. Um, so it rarely involves true vertigo in and of itself. It, it is something where we want to look very carefully for some other, at least, you know, possible, you know, stronger components that could be contributing to dizziness, whether, um, that's, um, non vestibular dizziness or, <laughs> um, you know, some vestibular component. And then uh, as far as treatment, you know, hopefully physical therapists are comfortable treating the neck. This is something we should know how to do. There are wonderful courses, and we'll talk uh, about at least one resource at the end here, but, um, you know, we want to address that uh, neck. Pretty much most of my vestibular patients get a little bit of neck love. I just think of nothing else. It helps them emotionally, <laughs> and this is a way to kind of get them more comfortable moving their head and neck as well. So a uh, win there. Um, tons of resources. You guys can screenshot this or whatnot. I'm not going to dig into all of them now, but just some kind of ways that as a physical therapist, uh, resources that might be helpful to you uh, to go ahead and look at some treatment options in detail. All right, we're going to move right on to medication induced dizziness because we are running low on time. It's such a deep topic. Um, so I'm not going to get into every medication that causes dizziness because that's my patient's joke. I think I'm all, always taking at least 10 medications that have dizziness as a possible side effect. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is if you can try to tie like some sort of kind of timing, like, oh, I it was fine. And then the doctor prescribed a new medication and I started taking it. And since then I felt dizzy this an hour after I take it or something kind of where you can kind of pin down some sort of, you know, possible association that could be a clue. Any other tips on when you might think medication is in the game here for a dizziness uh, causation? I completely agree with the timing. Um also look into lifestyle habits that might have changed, especially if they're on antihypertensives, diuretics, they might have stopped drinking water or changed their timing of drinking water. And so they have a relative hypovolemia um, that is being exacerbated by the medications. Um, and then I generally think about um, working with their primary care doctor and doing an experimental withdrawal of medications. If that is a question, then systematically going through them and seeing if it makes them feel better, if nothing else is really helping. Um, and then I do generally find that if they are having a hallucination of motion, vertigo, that's less likely to come from a medication, but more of a, a dizziness that's hard for them to discuss. And there is a temporal nature to it, then I am going to look into that type of systematic withdrawal of medications. Right. So look at their list and try to get a sense of timing, I think, is my personal advice as a physical therapist, trying to dig through if that's actually a root uh, contributing factor to dizziness. All right, moving right along, alcohol. So lots of information here. In summary, alcohol affects the brain. It affects your peripheral nerves. It affects your vestibular apparatus itself. Um, depending on what volume you've had and how much you've had over time and how many years you've been drinking at what level. A lot of variables there. Um, and I learned today that there is a real spin the bottle game that you can buy that's on a pre-set spinning <laughs> apparatus that you can buy on Amazon. These are the things you only learn when you Google things like alcohol dizzy to see what images come up. Um, <laughs> so, and then dehydration, orthostatic related dizziness um, from alcohol ingestion. So lots of 
potential factors there. Do not assume that your patient does not have that on board or that's not an issue. Do like have a gentle conversation. Um, and then we had lots of other kind of what I'll call medical kind of contributors to dizziness. So everything from low blood sugar. I hope people are thinking about that one. I do ask my patients, when's the last time you ate? <laughs> if they're like, oh, I feel lightheaded. <laughs> um, and hydration, things like that, right? Um, we worry about thyroid conditions. Um, this is something that hopefully a primary care or some physician is monitoring. You can always check in with them. I am a big communicator. I hope that everybody's all about collaboration uh, as far as if there's multiple providers caring for a patient, you know, so you can touch base. Um, because sometimes patients will tell me something that they've told me they've never told their doctor. <laughs> um, so I will tell them, please tell your doctor, and you want me to talk to your doctor, um, you know, to try to facilitate that communication. Um, as you may be that missing link as the provider is the only one who heard something uh, that seems to be an issue or a concern. Um, and then this uh, article nicely pointed out the relationship between thyroid condition and increased incidence of Meniere's disease. Um, so again, that leads us back to our vestibular dizziness bucket um, to again, think about these layers of how the different systems interact and how we can have dizziness that can come from a combination of non-vestibular dizziness and vestibular dizziness. Um, and then the disuse disequilibrium, which is deconditioning, can also make people feel kind of off, <laughs> unsteady, those kind of terms. Um, so we should be able to assess that as physical therapists and refer if you're not a physical therapist for that, for the patient to be able to get some guided, you know, activity because it's difficult to maybe initiate that uh, on one's own. So, you know, leave some time for questions. <laughs> Dizziness, you know, can come from many sources. We're trying to screen. Don't get overwhelmed as a practitioner. Hopefully you're, again, communicating, working as a team you know, looking for some kind of hints or red flags that I should at least screen for this, check for that. We've offered some opportunities for y'all um, to do that, whether it's, you know, blood pressure check, things like that. So make sure we're kind of looking for those different variables um, and then leading you all to some resources. So first of all, Dr. Gold, fantastic video library I mentioned. There's the link there. So screenshot this guy. Um, also his book, recently came out fantastic. <laughs> um, if you don't mind me saying so, Dr. Gold. Um, you, you, can, you can say it again. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone go out and purchase it today. Um, <laughs> I get no royalties. Um, no, it really is an excellent resource. Um, and I hope that any physician or medical provider, um, you know, would pick it up because it's just a nice reference. It's a way to kind of just check on something real quick. You don't necessarily have to read it cover to cover, although you could. Um, and it is available on Amazon and a few other uh, book providers out there. If you Google it, you can find it for sure. Um, and for uh, Dr. Stiernerson, uh, she made some recommendations, in particular neurosymptoms.org is a great resource. Um, and then also you both have mentioned Dr. Timothy Haynes' website, very comprehensive, a lot of words so read it in chunks but it's it's got really great re, re, uh, always evidence base which i i do appreciate it and he lets you know when he's just showing his opinion if there isn't literature on an area so that's nice um <laughs> i appreciate him he, giving you the heads up right <laughs> he uh, always has an opinion yes and that's okay that's okay it's very experienced we, right. we appreciate his opinions um and cervicogenic dizziness another resource i want to poke you all to is cervicaldizziness.com. Uh, Dr. Harrison and Dr. Danielle Vaughn, uh, both excellent course instructors on this topic, and also um, a ton of resources on that website for that condition. So you can at least see they're also evidence based. You can see what is there, what we do know, and you know how we might go about um, you know kind of thinking about that piece. And then autonomic conditions, dysautonomiainternational.org is a great website in my experience. And if you're into Facebook groups, um, particularly there's one for POTS, there's tons of other ones for these other conditions, I'm sure, but this one I really found to be a nice resource of kind of different providers who are caring for these, again, complex patients. Um, so I think that's soup to nuts. We're gonna go into our Q&A. All right, so first question I can read clearly is, 
Dr. Sternerson, I'm a big fan. <laughs> I get some of your referrals at El Camino Hospital and love to meet you one of these days. <laughs> Shanna Townsend, <laughs> PT. Uh, not a question, but very sweet. All right. What medications can help with persistent upbeating nystagmus? Thought to be caused by Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome. A patient may also have vestibular migraine and 3PD. Oh, that's not that's not hard at all. Who wants to talk about that one? Not me. <laughs> uh, I can take that one. Yeah, I mean, uh, so typically, acutely, it's upbeat, and I've got some nice examples in my collection actually of uh, a patient who had upbeat in the ED, and then we saw him a year later, but his his father had taken the video in the ED where it clearly has upbeat. We saw him a year later, it's downbeat. That's actually very common that the upbeat transitions to downbeat over time. Um, so some of the medications, upbeat oftentimes will go away. And, and so oftentimes you don't really need to do much about that. Um, but there are some medications for upbeat, including formenopyridine and Namenda, Mamantine. Um, perhaps baclofen, but then if it transitions to downbeat, you've got some other potential medications to use. And uh, unfortunately, I have a couple patients who have downbeat from chronic Wernicke's and the medications for amenopyridine, other medications haven't done a whole lot. So uh, it's a tricky population. I see Dr. Steenerson nodding along with me. So I suspect she's had a, a similar experience. I'll echo that. And I think it's, they've already done this, but I think it's really helpful to look in for a reactive, look into reactive vestibular migraine or 3PD in these circumstances too, just yep. to see if there's any other potential medications, treatments that might help this person, but it can be just super hard to control the nystagmus if it's been there persistently. Mm -hmm. Right. That being said, I've had conversations with uh, Jorge Cata and others, and they've had good results. So it's really, you never know. I've had some patients who have life-changing response to some of these medications, and the next patient looks exactly the same and has nothing or doesn't tolerate it. So but I think it's always worth trying something. Definitely agree. They're very benign, I think, overall, too. So it's worth trying. Great. All right, next question. So I see a uh, praise for Dr. Gold. Here we go. Thank you so much for an amazing library. It's my go-to place to look for tricky eye movements when I see them in my patients. And then a question um, kind of related to the eyes for Dr. Gold. Uh, did you say something about severe dry eye and that can relate to dizziness? Can you kind of, ex kind of expound upon that a little bit for us? Um, Dr. Gold? No, not, not really. <laughs> Uh, I was talking about in the setting of sort of visual vertigo or visual symptoms, maybe there's some some uh, overlapping photophobia in that patient who has migraine. And sometimes photophobia uh, or other visual symptoms could be ocular in, in origin. And sometimes photophobia could be due to dry eye, for instance. But uh, not there's no direct correlation that I'm aware of between severe dry eye and dizziness, per se. All right, that's helpful. A little clarification there. All right, a lot of things to think about. All right, will eccentric gaze testing enhance uh, SOM, that superior oblique myokymia movements? Is it a good way to confirm? Yeah, no, absolutely. Great question. So you always want to bring the eye into a position where the severe oblique is going to be excited, right, where it's more likely to fire. So if I suspect right superior oblique myokymia, I would have the patient look down and to the left. That's where uh, the superior oblique muscle is kind of uh, most active, the right superior oblique muscle. So absolutely, uh, trying to provoke it in the clinic, sometimes that works, sometimes it happens spontaneously, but um, I agree. Awesome, okay. Um, another uh, clinician has put in, when examining several patients with infrared lenses, I've noticed a persistent jittery eye movement um, medial lateral is what she's describing. Do you have an explanation for this? Can you talk about kind of more subtle eye movements? I've actually, you know, seen a few of those myself. What kind of possible explanations right. could there be there? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd have to see a video. I mean, it, I see a lot of little square wave jerks, uh, and it could be that that's what they're referring to. 
I'm just not sure there are 800 different kinds of intrusions and oscillations, or is this nystagmus, or is this convergent spasm, or so I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure based on that. But I would say by far, especially in older people, these little square wave jerks, you're going to see them uh, with video oculography, you're going to see them on your screens. And uh, being able to, to kind of differentiate them from nystagmus is helpful. I've got a bunch of examples in my collection if you want to know what square wave jerks are or what they look like. That's a great way to, to point back to the library. And so, you know, check out square wave jerks and then check out some options on vestibular migraine. I can tell you that for me, I've seen quite a few abnormalities in people with known vestibular migraine between migraines. Um, it's not unusual to see like kind of a weird downbeat or kind of, it, it, again, it might be quick, it might be small. Um, but it's just, you know, that we can kind of end up tying back that there's no other findings, no other things going on. And it's just kind of, unfortunately, some people with different conditions, we get these kind of, uh, uh, called red herrings, but unusual findings. Uh, yeah. And how, I would say, I, I would say with, with fixation removed, if you see downbeat and different abnormalities with fixation, then, then they deserve more of a workup. I wouldn't, yes. I wouldn't automatically say that's migraine. That's a good point. Good unless point. unless they're in the midst of an attack, and then anything goes. <laughs> yes, true, true. No, but in fish case removed, you can definitely see, yeah, more subtle things for sure, which I think is what Terry is talking about. All right. Labat is asking, how common is superior oblique myokymia? Uh, do you have a number on that, Dr. Gold? I know we kind of talked about that briefly earlier. I don't. It's pretty rare. Okay. Cool. Not sure. That's fine. Good work. All right. Um, would prisms be helpful in patients with uh, the MLF, the medial longitudinal fasciculus syndrome? Yeah, potentially. So uh, again, if somebody has a stroke, somebody has uh, an MS exacerbation, typically it's going to improve. It's going to get better. But some people have lingering deficits. And uh, if they've been stable for long enough, absolutely. Prism can be really helpful for both the intranuclear ophthalmoplegia part of it, the horizontal diplopia, as well as if they have a persistent skew. Fortunately, the skews tend to resolve, um, but that would be a vertical prism, whereas the INO would be a horizontal prism. Perfect, all right, I think we got time for one more here. We'll have to stop it. Well, how frequently are you having the conversation with patients that symptoms may improve with central-based vestibular lesions or ocular-based conditions, but may not completely resolve? It really depends on what we're talking about. Uh, there are just so many. Some are very treatable. Some are not easily treatable. So I'm, I'm not sure how to, how to answer that. Yes. I agree. It's a really heterogeneous group that it's hard to make general statements about. Yes. So if anyone wants my two cents, which they may not, I would say, you know, to me, my conversation with most patients, uh, except for something that I feel like I could really have a good chance of clearing like BPPV, but <laughs> almost everything else I say, let's see how it goes. You know, we're gonna take it one day, one step at a time, do your homework, like, you know, um, just kind of, let's do the next right thing. There's a lot of ways to kind of phrase, you know, people kind of want answers. You can certainly at a certain point as a clinician say, okay, well, you know, most of the time, you know, I've seen this, but you know, you can, I think leaving the door open is important because Unfortunately, if people get a mindset that something's definitely not going to improve, I do think that can be a barrier to that even being a possibility. Um, obviously, on the flip side, we don't want to necessarily say, you're, there's no way you're not going to get better because that's usually like dangerous to make uh, promises that you can't necessarily keep. Um, so hopefully that's a good balance. If you guys are on board with that response, what do you think? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm super optimistic and the most positive person you've ever met when it comes to vestibular migraine or triple PD. When it comes to a patient coming in with down B due to a cerebellar ataxia, that's a, kind of a different story. It's a different conversation. Absolutely. I think you can gauge too. If they're looking for you to say you're going to be 100% perfect, I really try and manage those expectations. Awesome. All right. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Please add additional comments, uh, uh, excuse me, please add additional questions as comments to this video and we will get answers for them, I promise you. Thank you, Dr. Cole, Dr. Stearnison, for your insights. Uh, very helpful to learn as a PT and I would say for any clinician could benefit from watching this. So I hope that many people do, uh, really insightful. So 
Um, everyone says thank you, I'm sure. So um, really appreciate you all being here. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle's vintage jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we get all comers, uh, but that is good. We, we, we love that. We want people to learn. We want people to feel empowered. Um, Absolutely. So it's very exciting. So I'm going to say thank you, everyone, and good night. And uh, we'll see you next month for another great journal club. She's a PT. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a jeweler, it's okay, too. Just to be clear, we appreciate you either way, but that's awesome. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.